Voilà, so this afternoon, uh, we will talk more about illusion uh, cinema, uh, I would say, scenography, space, who's you undefined space of uh, darkness. Um, with uh, this uh, lecture from Illusion is a thing simulating night at the atmospheric cinema. And we have two guests uh, uh, today. Uh, Carlotta Darrow, um, she's a doctor of, uh, in art history, assistant professor at ENSA Paris Malaquais since uh, 2012, and member of the Infrastructure Architecture Territory Laboratory. Her research explores the impact of sound uh, technologies, telecommunication infrastructure, and media in the architectural and urban culture of the 20th century. Right. <laughs> Uh, she's an author of uh, many books, uh, Avant-Garde Sonore en Architecture, Les Murs du Son, uh, Le Poème Electronique, uh, and I think I didn't forget anything, I hope. Voilà. And uh, Yann uh, Rocher, you also a senior lecturer, uh, professor, you also do exhibition uh, curation, and, uh, and you design uh, uh, scenography uh, for you also, uh, with a collective. Huh? Um, his teaching and research focus on the history and design of scenic places, acoustic exhibition scenography, and the construction of space through vision architecture as a geographical or astronomical tool, analysis of the architectural project and representation, architecturally narration and modeling. Promising. Voilà. So I let you uh, maybe begin, and uh, let's see after if some of you have uh, some question. Okay. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, I'll share my screen. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, Roberto Zancan for this invitation. We would like to thank Roberto Zancan for this invitation. And uh, we are very sorry of not being physically with you in Geneva, um, but we are also very grateful for the possibility you allow us uh, you allow us to, to share our work from distance. Um, so this is an ongoing project that Jan Roche and myself are exploring uh, since uh, quite a, um, uh, some time. Uh, so it's an ongoing project. So everything, any feedback that will come from you, of course, would be more than welcome and precious for us in order to uh, pursue this uh, research. So it's about uh, atmospheric cinemas. Um, well, I will start and we will uh, switch from uh, myself and Jan Roche and uh, we will go this way. So in a history of architecture of movie theaters that is distinguished by an illusionist and fanciful capacity of the enclosed space associated with the technical apparatus of projection, the more specific history of atmospheric theaters deserves a separate development. Doubtless, in a form of continuity with the Balladian theatrical tradition, which already simulated the, the opening of the sky on the ceiling of a closed dome, evoking in reality the Greek open air theater with its uh, classical scenes, it was in the 20s that this theatrical typology asserted itself in the sector of film production. The illusion of an open sky has been a theme dear to architecture since the Renaissance, at the very moment when the first dedicated theaters reenacted the ancient open air models in closed interiors. The Baroque period was not to be outdone since it multiplied the church frescoes simulating the opening of the world towards the celestial divinity. It is always a zenithal opening to the sky, invaded by profusion of sorry, cloud. Sorry, just one thing. Can you just remove the little tab on the back of your presentation? Then we can see the legend. It's on the, on the bottom. This one? Um, no, on the bottom. Ah, yeah, you voilà. mean... Thanks so much. Yeah. Oh. Uh... I'm not sure it's because if I you prefer like this? But maybe if you just move it, voila. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, 
Uh, I was here. Uh, it is always a zenithal opening to the sky, embedded by a profu profusion of clouds, which hosts several scenes from mythology and religion. Among the techniques of dream, creation, and illusion, the image is worth less by its configuration than by its mobility, by its internal dynamism, and the extent of the imaginary variations to which it lends itself. In this sense, I quote, it is certain that the cloud provides a reverie with an incomparable uh, material, what writes uh, Hubert Damisch. The cloud confers a, a pictorial quality, as Wolfling describes it, to the classical orthogonal tectonic space of the Quattrocento. It allows a form of baroque ubiquity that will also be found as a supporting principle in cinematographic projection rooms. This game of illusion persists in the case of atmospheric cinemas, at the time when the seventh art is investing places that are technically imperatively closed in order to be able to totally control the illusionary capacity of the projected film without interference from the outside environment. It is a paradoxical form of project in which architecture challenges its own material properties through artificial illusionary devices. It is in this context of the rise of the illusionist spectacle and the intensification of a more open social and worldly life than the classical theater that the theme of night becomes central. Thus, the reversal of the cycle of light and darkness is a natural part of the ceremonial of the film show inside a closed box that stimulate, simulates an artificial nightscape, simulating a luminous progression, a sun rays, which will give way to lightning of the film once the show has begun. An artifice within the artifice, the second one erasing the first one. This is the principle of atmospheric theater translated into light. In order to grasp some of the meanings at stake in the atmospheric theaters and uh, these artificial aspects of the sky, it is necessary to consider them more broadly in the history of theaters in relation to nature. This relation is often, often seen by historians as well as designers as a lost link, a link exemplified by the open air theaters from antiquity. In that sense, a theater architect and scenographer like uh, Joseph Urban offers a relevant example. In his treatise theaters written in uh, 1929, he explicitly develops the idea that the main task of today's designer is to rebuild through performance venues, the ideal link of antiquity between architecture, audience, actor, and nature. The same idea, idea is perceptible in the natural history of the theater, an essay imagined by Theodor Adorno at the beginning of the thirties. I quote, where today we have the gallery the, the sky used to peer in on the theater and the play of the drifting clouds dreamily made contact with the human theater beneath. The, so those who sat there were the spokesmen of the clouds in the trial of the stage action taking place below. The legitimacy of that action could be weakened or broken by their objections. The dome, has long since closed over the theater and now reflects the sounds coming from the stage, uh, bearing a view of the sky. But those who sit nearest to it know that the roof is not firmly fixed above them and wait to see whether it won't burst open one day and bring about that reunification of stage and reality, which is reflected reflected uh, for us in an image composed equally of memory and hope." Quote, uh, end of quote. This tension between stage and reality, between the theater as a continuity with nature and as uh, an artificial autonomy, is a strong and useful reading key on the atmospheric cinemas. Indeed, 
like the traditional proscenium theater of the Renaissance, the atmospheric model is based on the principle of an enclosed and artificial space, a principle which guarantees the comfortable condition of the cinematic illusion and suggests to somehow replay the nature and the city inside it. The atmospheric night invented uh, uh, as we will see by John Eberson, could therefore be qualified from this per perspective as a lost night, the de deliberate choice of a modernist sky reproduction by technical means. Let's not forget though, like the Choral, Choral de Comedias or the Elizabethan theater perfectly illustrate that the separation from nature is not a fatality. And that, that at, the, at the time when the atmospheric model appears, the driving formulates a model where the nature sky remains a part of the overall setup, even if it can be conditioned by a certain urban, urban environment. But let's contextualize further in the history of cinematic venues. Even if the very first cinematographic projection rooms were of great simplicity, rectangular volumes with the stage to accommodate a piano and an auditorium filled with wooden chairs or benches, it is easy to find several examples and contexts that may have inspired the emergence of atmospheric theaters. If we think of the magical origin of the seventh art, this development in cinema, for example, has important crossover elements. The trick film, which gradually disappeared in the course of the 20th century, was one of the most important genres during the first decade of the exploitation of the cinematograph, closely associated with the name of Georges Méliès. Unlike other authors, who used the cinematograph in a realistic and documentary way, Méliès saw in this medium the possibility of extending the palette of the art of illusion or prestidigitation. As it was developed during the 19th century, illusionism was based on the study of optical and the limits of biophysical laws. In 1888, Méliès took over the management of the Rue Berroudin Theatre, set up at the 8th Boulevard des Italiens after an initial period of activity from 1845 to 1852 at the Palais Royal. This room on the second floor of a stone building containing about 200 people, 60.5 meter long, 6.6 .6 wide, and four meter deep was in itself already an architecture of artifice through the exploitation of the spatial possibilities of the theater, such as the curtain, the backstage, the raised stage, and the insertion of numerous tricks integrated into, into the architecture. The side consoles communicated with the backstage area. Hatches were concealed in the carpet patterns. Pedal controls were used to operate props and the table via cables and poly, as well as a real pneumatic pipe systems and acoustic tubes. And finally, an electrical circuit was integrated to the setting. Behind the appearance of a mundane salon with a trompe l'oeil paintings simulating an horizon of pavilions and rich vegetation that extends into the relief of orna uh, ornamentation of the room, a large machinery allowed the, the exploration of several possibilities of illusion. However, the discovery of the cinematograph shook up this pal his palette of tools by moving from the artifice created by devices in architectural space, the theater to that of illusionist projection on a simple surface, a screen. A year after attending the first public performance of the cinematograph by the Lumière brothers, Méliès made a series of short film in 1896, the first trick films in history, by setting up a film studio on his property in Montreuil. Hit by a fire, the theater was rebuilt in 1901, Méliès fell into ruin in 1913, and then theater was finally demolished in 1924. With the cinematograph, we move from the trick to the device, 
a single machine that puts forth an unprecedented capacity to capture, direct, determine, and control the behavior of spectators. The cinematograph then allows the spectator's attention to be concentrated on a single object, a single surface, which allows a linear succession of fantastic events. Méliès notably exploited the trick of stopping the camera, making the disappearance and appearance of objects his distinctive, distinctive feature. The rest of the devices integrated into to the architecture of the theater does lost their main illusionistic function, the trompe l'oeil becoming a frame from the central screen. Thus, several layers of deception and simulation from the set with its trompe l'oeil to the images on the screen make up this theater of cinematic projection. Atmospheric theater is a form of continuity with this tradition, combining both the simulation of another place through the physical setting of the stage around a central screen and the experience of film projection. All of these projects constitute a transitional phase between the theater of illusionary devices and the classic black box that tends to neutralize its physical properties, which is characteristic of modern cinemas. The absolute protagonist of this creative effervescence was John Eberson, an electrical engineer of Austro-Hungarian origin, Ukraine today, who after studying at the University of Vienna migrated to the United States in 1901, working first in an electricity company and after a few years joining the Johnson Realty and Construction Company, a construction company specializing in theaters promoting opera houses in small American towns for which Eberson became the designer. In 1908, John Eberson opened his own firm in St. Louis and in 1923, he created the first atmospheric cinema, the Houston Majestic in Texas. Eberson used this theatrical typology more than a hundred times in the United States until it was exported to other countries such as South America and Australia, but also to France. He was a consultant for the creation of the Grand Rex in Paris in 1932. This career path makes Eberson one of the most important builders of scenic venues in history alongside architects such as Fellner and Helmer in 19th century. Eberson designs have close antecedents such as Philadelphia's new theater with the ceiling painting as a daytime sky in the manner of many 18th century opera houses. And the Chicago's court theater designed as an outdoor amphitheater with the sky, moon and stars that were viewed through a trailer with hanging vines or the winter a uh, garden in Toronto is another striking anticipation designed to stimulate an outdoor scene with murals of plants, trellises, and even a lamp post on the walls, while the ceiling was covered with the real dried hanging leaves and of beach and wisteria floating gently in the breeze produced by a fan. As part of this whimsical setting, the lights were transformed into lanterns and the columns into tree trunks. The stage area itself represented the sky with painted clouds and an illuminated moon. Returning to the first truly atmospheric achievement, the Hoblitzel Majestic Theater in Houston, Eberson was both architect and set designer in his desire to recreate the illusion of an Italian piazza. Behind the neoclassical facade resembling a Roman palace, one entered the stage in a garden enclosed by asymmetrical walls of different sizes and dimensions with balconies and windows lit from within to simulate an internal life in contrast to the atmosphere of a simulated exterior. Fake tiles formed the roofs, trees and artificial vines were realistically placed on the facades the ceiling was painted a dark blue lit by a blue light that simulated evening twilight. The ceiling was perforated with bright lights that looked like stars. Moving clouds were projected on the ceiling just before the show, an orange light reproduced the sunset. For several combined reasons, the scenography of the events 
featured in the atmospheric theater as to be compared to a model invented more or less in the same years in Germany, namely the modern planetarium. Planned to be built in the Duchess Museum of Munich and under the form of a prototype on the roof of the Zeiss factory in Jena, it is important to underline that the concept of Walter Bauersfeld is a revolution in itself in its way of picturing the sky. If the famous uh, engraving by Fischer von Erla on the left of a Hungarian imperial bath, or the even more famous uh, Newton's cenotaph by Etienne Wiboulet on the right, prove that the stars uh, used to be represented in ancient time by perforations in the domes, the electrified version of the planetarium reverses the direction of light. No more light, natural light of the sun depicting the other distant suns. Um, but a central projection uh, um, able to, to light up the vault and most of all to revolve. These centrifugal and centripetal ways of lighting the sky are interestingly both present in our atmospheric archetype. In the uh, Palace Theater of Marion, for, for instance, the ceiling is punctually electrified, electrified as a star's representation while a cloud machine displays the lower atmospheric, atmospheric layers. The Merce Theater and the Akron Civic Theater work nearly the same way. The Fox Theater of Atlanta too, but benefits in its case from an additional system of flickering stars. These dramatic devices and effects, always more impressive and immersive for the public, are not very far from the planetarium's history. A history that has always hesitated between the popular dimension of the sky show and the scientific demonstration of it. Particularly, for example, the models of events by characters like Ibn uh, Abbas Ibn Firnas or, er, or Erad Weigel, both known to have provided weather effects in their respective cosmos theaters. Ultimately, it would be wrong to think that the cosmology, that is to say the order governing the atmosphere, is not a relevant notion for an entertainment space like the atmospheric cinema. Not only because each dome or vault in architecture sees at least the Roman pantheon call, calls for a cosmology. Um, not only because each performance venue since the Globe Theatre of London calls for a cosmology uh, likewise. But, but also because the theatrical repertoire and the scenography have sometimes been concerned with models of representation of the sky, of the night, and more generally what is called in astronomy, the frame of reference. A significant example from this point of view is the spectatorium designed by James Steele McKay for the Columbian exhibition of uh, Chicago in 1893. In the, the purpose of achieving the most realistic performance of the discovery of the America, or supposed discovery, McKay patents uh, an incredible amount of inventions among which a wind-making apparatus, a nebulator for rain and clouds effect, but is a realis realistic quest concerns the representation of night sky as well, as a reporter points out after seeing the model of the project, I quote again, <clears throat> by a peculiar arrangement, there is made to appear on the background of sky, the constellations of the Southern hemisphere, each star being given its correct magnitude by the light which ascends it, and each being set at the proper place in the firmament from a chart furnished by the ablest astronomers of the day." Quote stops. In other words, despite their indisputable fanciful variations on the sky, as fanciful as the Egyptian cinemas of the same period can be, the atmospheric theaters 
may be related to this dramatic science of the night representation. And one of the high representatives of this practical cosmology will be then Jules Moinet, whose words of L'Envers du Théâtre in 1873 sounds like an oracle to the Eberson's invention, I quote. The sky is sprinkled with uh, uh, twinkling stars, admirably imitated by means of a series of little gadgets. A little square of tin fitted at the center with an imitation diamond of colored glass is soon on the back of the curtain. A tiny lump fitted there sends its light through the facets of the diamond, which is just opposite the hole cut in the curtain. The light twinkles as you look at it. This is quite a cumbersome thing. However, since it, it, it requires a light for each star, one could undoubtedly obtain the same effect with one or several sources of electric light. In fact, as I mentioned before, another important reference is the Teatro Olimpico in Vicenza, began in 1580 by Andrea Palladio and completed in 1585 by Vincenzo Scamozzi, reproducing a Renaissance courtyard composed by a colonnade with statues surrounding the audience and the blue ceiling simulating an open sky. But this reference was never directly cited in Eberson's writing. Also, this great lighting expert remains the important creator of a true atmospheric typology of the theater through the amplitude of his production and the professionalization of his firm, which was to undergo further development. At the beginning of the 30s, at the end of the craze of atmospheric, John Eberson and his son, Dew, turned to the construction of numerous theaters in the Decost style of the time, transforming the box of illusions into a streamlined, decorated space. Theaters were reduced in size, volumes were simplified, and plans were standardized. Illusionist decorations gave way to other elements, such as mirrors and acoustic panels. The adjective atmosphere was used to designate the various scenographic, decorative, and technical contribution referring to other worlds, from Egypt to Persia, the Andalusian, and the Mediterranean sky, and was also applied to service and circulation spaces, such as halls, lounges, balconies, and mezzanines. A symmetrical spatial organization was the order of the day to keep the public's interest at the highest level. If illusion was the thing, an impredictable effect of repetition was an obstacle to the magic of wonder theater. I quote uh, John Eberson, asymmetry is essential in a scheme of this kind because it gives the variety needed to keep interest high and importantly, repetition would destroy that illusion. Here, the illusion is the thing. A commentator in the Daily News in 1929 described Eberson's versatility as a creator of modern theater, combining both classical pictorial skill with the mastery of the electrical potentialities of his time. I quote, he was a man of great conceptions, realized in the smallest practical detail. He was more than an architect. However, in implementing his revolutionary innovations in theater construction, he followed in the footsteps of the great Michelangelo. Employing many arts, Mr. Eberson is an architect, engineer, interior decorator, and wall painter, using artificial lighting as well as brushes to achieve his color effect, and he applies all his knowledge to create his contribution to the modern theater, the illusion of the outdoors, and of course. The illusion of the outdoors. The illusion of the outdoors constitutes another similarity with the modern planetarium in terms of the structure of the sky itself and distance. Just like the starry vault of Bauersfeld, but also many georamas of the 19th and 20th centuries, the atmospheric theater faces the question of how to express infinity in an enclosed geometry. 
this uh, specific problem finds a concrete answer in the planetarium through a double device. On the one hand, a 360 degrees horizon, which usually symbolizes the countryside and nearby urbanizations, thanks to a play of shadows. And on the other end, a hemispherical screen welcoming the intangible stars provided by the projection method. In fact, that the Ebersons model is organized according to the same con contrast between a peripheral and a plastic foreground and a distant and smooth southern land of the sky. Except that the movie theater, unlike the centered space of the planetarium, is also built on a horizontal tension between the audience cavea and the cinema screen. Basically, the atmospheric theater has to combine and accommodate two contradictory projections, two contradictory modes of representation within its space. The vertical frame of the open sky and the horizontal frame of the cinematic window. Night and day cycles are usually used in cultural venues for scientific purposes. In uh, a natural history museum, for example, the diurnal and nocturnal succession can certainly be spectacular, but it is above all an illustration of a biological rhythm of a given environment. In rare cases, like the Fleischmann Atmospherium Planetarium as it, at its opening in uh, Renault in uh, 1963, this idea can lead to an even more accurate simulation of uh, night and day conditions with a full range of phenomena, including cloud formations, thunderstorms, or rainbows. Comparatively, it appears that the nocturnal narration of, of the atmospheric theater fulfills the function of a gradual transition between the open sky and the cinematic window. As night falls over the audience, day dawns on the screen, assuming the theatricality of the auditorium itself, generally limited to the golden stucco or, or the raising of the curtain, the later being preserved in the cinematic ritual of this period. This theatrical, theatricality of the auditorium has always been the subject of debate in the history of theaters, not only for the risk of uh, overshadowing the theatricality of the show itself, but also for its possible remaining presence during the show. In that respect, the nocturnal narration of the atmospheric theater set certainly does not provide enough darkness to fully neutralize the exuberant forms of its architecture. Maybe this choice can be seen as a sort of spatial compensation to the frontal and pictorial condition of the cinema screen. Overall, the characteristic, oh, sorry. The characteristic of atmospheric theaters is that they are designed to evoke the feeling of a particular time and place through the use of spotlights, electric light, and plaster architectural elements that evoke the feeling of being in the open air. Exotic or exotic set designs frame a stage hidden behind a dropped curtain. The scenography generally forms the outlines of the room and stands out against the simulated sky on the intrados of the room. In this way, atmospheric theater assumes the role of making the room a spectacle in its, in its own right, a space that modernity and generic cinemas will soon neutralize. The audience discovers this interiorized cityscape through a magical spectacle of the illusion. Indirect lighting is widely used by Eberson to recreate outdoor gardens by reversing the natural order, light for the night represented by the room's decor and the darkness for the projected show. The architecture is then exposed to new laws. It, explore, it, it explores new possibilities of the relationship 
between nature and artifice, between artificial nature and natural artifice. This relatively simple apparatus was also considered to be inexpensive and convinced several theater owners to use it to promote the culture of the show to a wider audience. An electric panel controlling the lights cloud be operated by a could, uh, sorry, uh, controlling the lights could be operated by a single operator and uh, the plaster decorative apparatus was less expensive than the more rigid decoration of traditional theaters. Driven by a generous and egalitarian spirit, Eberson believed that he could educate masses of cinema goers by immersing them in classic environments and experiences of grandeur for a minimal price. This combination of refined culture and economy resulting from technological advances in equipment and an innovative approach to construction using prefabricated elements was Eberson's success and allowed him to produce even larger and more complex movie palaces across the United States for several years. And here we conclude the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, especially for the presentation and for this uh, marvelous, uh, iconic uh, icon iconography also of, of space, uh, which is uh, actually, uh, of course, uh, bring us to an, another time. And the uh, first question, um, how come suddenly uh, this illusion, illusion space uh, stopped uh, through the history? Is it, can we just confront the technology as a main aspect of, of as a first uh, murder, let's say, of, of this uh, illusion space? I think that um, it, it wasn't just technical. I think it's more about the changes of uh, taste. Um, as, as we say, that then they turned the building more art deco cinemas, maybe in order even to make it more simple. Um, and uh, to, to open even more the access to this uh, new form of uh, uh, mondan uh, uh, divertissement. And uh, so it, it, it became simpler and simpler. And um, this way of uh, bringing the spectator in an illusionary place maybe took place, especially during the 20s, early 30s, like uh, the pleasure of being in a, in somewhere else, this uh, idea of uh, ubiquity that it's very present. And then in the 30s, it, it, it becomes more standardized art deco um, typology. Yeah, it's uh, interesting because uh, in my uh, in my experience, we are actually uh, doing a cinema with uh, with my bureau, and it's true that uh, uh, mm -hmm. it's a cinema from from the 50s, 60s now, and uh, we have uh, white leather on the wall for some part, very little, but still, uh, we uh, the people from specialists of THX technology ask us to even remove this white because yeah. it just have a bit of reflection. So sure. basically, the main process is to avoid fully the experience of, of the theater itself to bring the biggest screen ever. And, and all the yeah. pictures that you bring, which is super interesting also, that the screen is actually very small. In mm -hmm. all the illusion space, actually, it's practically anecdotic how the, sc how the screen is actually okay. look like a TV uh, screen, practically, compared okay. to the rest of the room. Well, the size was very big. Yeah, um, the, the screen compared to the theater look like very small in proportion yeah, yeah, sure, you know sure. like yeah. no no sure certainly no you're right maybe that's that's why we i think we insisted a lot with this uh precedent really to 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 underline the fact that it's a transitionary stage maybe from the theater as conceived as a fake outdoor environment to a assumed interior space where all the physical properties of architecture are totally uh, yeah. hidden. Yeah, very interesting, of course. That some of you have questions, maybe. Maybe Jan wants to. Roberto, I'm sure. 
we were discussing about the fact that there are many connections with what we have start to see in the other presentation, especially with uh, uh, sure. Sebastian, mm -hmm. that is near us, but also to some of the reference to, uh, to the sky that were in the presentation of, uh, of the first one yesterday, of uh, Elzini. And, uh, and so we are trying to connect in arguments more than, than a question. So I, I no, it's there. Uh, also, the form of vision is very concerned about all this situation, but uh, maybe you can talk more about, the, if you want, uh, more about the atmosphere, the concept of atmosphere, because it's something that uh, is coming back a lot in this, uh, in this seminar. Uh, it's, uh, it seems yeah. that we can talk only in terms of atmosphere for the architecture of the night, and uh, yeah. I don't know. What we... We tried with uh, Carlotta is to 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 build uh, perspectives to 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 learn more, understand more about this model, and I think that uh, it's uh, important perspectives are, are uh, to be found in 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 the scenography of the of the sky in the theater repertoire, but also in the in the cosmic theaters that uh, I've mentioned. And um, within the, this example, I think the, the, the atmosphere uh, can be seen as a, you know, uh, this demurge question of rebuilding the sky by yourself to 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 perform it again. And uh, in in that in that way, it's not not really uh, an ambience matter more than a, I I don't know how do you reproduce the sky and all the effects with uh, machineries. And there, there, there is a, a very interesting and, and rich uh, history of, of this, uh, um, of, of this uh, oppression in, in humankind, I, I believe. So I would like, well, what, I, what we could do in, in, uh, when we will finish the, this work is to, uh, to, to, to try to understand better atmosphere in that in that uh, way but and otherwise we we, we, we found this example of the uh, atmospherium uh, uh, planetarium built in, in 1963 in Reno in Nevada and which is not at the beginning which which was not only a plan, uh, uh, a typical uh, planetarium but something, more more general where 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 weather effects would would have been uh, possible so uh, uh, another uh, hypothesis is that uh, maybe the, there is a, a history of uh, uh, culture or venues where, where you 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 try to rebuild the weather Carlotta, do you want to? Yeah. to... No, you're <laughs> right, Roberto, that uh, it's uh, nowadays is a term that is uh, coming back uh, in a very strong way. And maybe, maybe it's more associated with the material uh, effect of uh, environmental um, tools. Uh, so, so it's more approached in a perceptive way, you know, and, and uh, actually following this history, we can, from one side, we can say that it's an old research team, so it's not just something that comes with uh, uh, very high-tech technologies. Um, and this, uh, one second um, reflection could be that uh, it's even about material things because you cannot build an artificial um, atmosphere uh, without uh, really building this uh, this box, this uh, artificial sky, this uh, machinery. So our intention was really to be quite descriptive in order to really try to understand because it's not always easy. We, we have few documents, original documents from uh, Eberson himself. So to really understand what was uh, used principally, mostly, and it's it apparently is a really this combination between artificial lighting and, and um, 
and the stuccos, these uh, light uh, decorations. And it's interesting because, it, as you said, he came even before in other lectures, the idea that the, you reproduce the night by using the light. It's a kind of paradox, but it's like this. I mean, otherwise it's just a black box and you don't see anything. I would like to add something on the atmosphere question. I think uh, atmosphere is precisely what is not possible to control as architecture. <laughs> and it's a, it's a kind of impossible quest. Um, you, uh, you, you, you to Philip make... Ram. Yeah. yeah, but it's, it's yeah, very I'm difficult. Because... Yeah, yeah you're, you're right. You're right. But I think, yeah, you know, uh, dealing with light, with acoustic is already complicated. And I think it's very interesting to, to see that, uh, well, this idea of controlling the atmosphere, what, what, what are the parameters? What are the, the, the tools to simply to, to well, to, call, to try to control it? And, and this uh, rely to uh, uh, another approach, maybe to, to, to architecture with, well, not the, the, the what, what, not architecture as a skin, but as a, a phenomenon inside in the skin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Martin, you want to say? Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, thanks for uh, for a great and incredibly rich uh, talk. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, I have uh, many questions, uh, but the main one is. Uh, uh, actually about the, you could say, the historical awareness of Ibbotson himself. I mean, you uh, contextualized uh, the phenomenon that you look at, I mean, very, convincing, very convincingly in a, in a long history, which obviously also resonates very much with the 17th and, and 18th century. Um, <clears throat> but I was actually incredibly struck uh, by the, the architecture that uh, the, the architectural scenography that is part of these uh, atmospheric theaters, which uh, seems to be obviously it's it's an architecture of stucco, so it can easily be re reproduced, changed, and so on. But at the same time, it at the very least it seems to be quite specific. And you also mentioned that there was a kind of didactic uh, uh, purpose uh, 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 behind it. So I, I just. Uh, I'd like you to perhaps elaborate a little bit on this kind of um, synergy between spectacle, spectacle and immersion on the one hand, then this kind of didactic agenda as a second element, and then you could say the ornamentality of the architecture, which, as you just said in answer to the first question, seems to be something that then progressively disappeared. But, but there seems to be really a kind of, it seems to be almost programmatic. And, and, and uh, uh, I would be very curious to hear a little bit more about that and whether this kind of programmatic intentions, if there are any, have something to do with a kind of historical awareness of this prehistory uh, of, 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 uh, that, that, that you were uh, uh, hinting at. Um, maybe I, I will answer and maybe Jan, if you want to add something. I, for the moment, we didn't find any precise reconstruction. Actually, it was really the, the intention of um, uh, offering a kind of um, pasticcio in the sense that you can see that the references are uh, various. They are even mixed, I would say, if, you, if we try to, to really observe elements by element. Um, sometimes it's a more uh, classical, sometimes it's more uh, uh, coming from Arabic word or, or uh, there is a, a combination of different uh, uh, languages, decorative languages. So I don't think for the moment we don't find, we didn't find any um, in his work because he wrote, he wrote a sketchbook and some, there are some documents from him, some articles. And uh, he um, explains that uh, he has this intention of being uh, uh, generous in the sense that he wanted to transmit this uh, heritage, cultural heritage to the, the, to the cinema goers. 
uh, but it's, he's never precise in terms of references and uh, he doesn't go farther to this. And I would say that he is a, his rhetoric is a little bit the rhetoric of an entrepreneur that he has to sell his, uh, his architecture. So to convince the owners of theaters to, to choose this, uh, this style for opening the access to a larger public. Um, I would read a little bit of um, uh, even a kind of rhetoric intention that it's, is, is not really pedagogical in the sense that is really trying to make a precise quotation in history or what else. But I don't know, Jan, if you have another. Um... Well, thank, thank you, Martin. It's, uh, on top of that, I, I, I would like to say that uh, the, the, this uh, architecture, uh, arch architectural scenography, to me, is very uh, strong, very affirmative in the auditorium. Usually, when you build a, an auditorium, you, you try to balance a bit and to <laughs> restrain a bit the decoration so that it, it's it's not too much for the for the show. And I think this is a, a limit case, is if I if I can if I may say a limit case of uh, over saturated uh, auditorium. Um, and uh, during the, the the preparation, I, I was thinking about other uh, comparable uh, examples of oversaturated or, or narration spaces of, uh, of theater, but I, I couldn't find a so, uh, so um, uh, preformed <laughs> uh, space. Um, about uh, the, the, the exotic decoration, the, this, the exotic references is, is uh, as a various uh, um, declination. It can be uh, Spanish, it can be Mediterranean, sometimes it's, it's more uh, oriental, so it's not clear, but it makes me think that at that period on the West Coast, Hollywood and, and also the, the West cinemas used to, to quote a lot of exotic, uh, exotic uh, models, Egyptian and others. So I, I think we, 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 have, we still have work and, and we've got to dig a, a bit more to to finally maybe find the, 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 the why Eberson decided to replay this. This it's not an Arcadian night. It's not, it, because it is too much urbanized. So it, it's it's not referring to Arcadia, for for example. So it's, it's not clear where is it coming from. Great, thanks. Thank like you. Of oversaturation, it's something to think about. And, and uh, if we follow this idea, it's interesting how actually it's also a, st a stage, stage set in this way. Uh, even the, um, let's say, the more contemporary example as Las Vegas, when you actually become suddenly the hero of the city by playing and by being in the stage, maybe it was also this approach of uh, bringing the spectator inside of those space to actually become the actor also of, the, of this decor. It was a bit the same time, yeah. Which is... Yeah, can can I say something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. which is which is not uh, very often in 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 theater. Very, in uh, uh, 1909, uh, the Austrian critic uh, Karl Kraus uh, said in in uh, in in his book. Uh, 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 well, I couldn't. I, I don't know the title in English. Anyway, D and contre D in French. And is in this text, which, um, which, uh, which is uh, aphorical, uh, aphoristical, it states at some point that uh, usually when you are in the darkness of, of uh, a theater, you, you are happy to be part of a, a total darkness mm -hmm. where there, there is no more individual distinction. So the, the scenario in the, in the atmospheric theater is, is pretty different because uh, you can imagine that with the light of the screen, the, the, this decoration is, is, is there, but also the public can be seen. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for everything. It was very uh, enlightening to, see, to hear you.